usually I ask people where they want to begin, but obviously we're beginning with your new book. <laughs> Gender Without Identity. This is an amazing book. Thank you for writing this book. Um, maybe we could even start with the way you start the book, with the whole story behind the book, because I think it's really important. And I think it's really great that you included the story in the book, because it's important that people in the field know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And do you want to jump in? Well, sure, and then we'll we'll tie team. So uh, first, thank you so much for for having us on to talk about this book. We're really excited about it, and we're so excited to have you as one of our first readers and to get to be in conversation with you. It's it's really a privilege um, to get to exchange ideas. So so thank you. Um, and as you said, this we begin with telling the story of this unlikely book, or maybe I should sell, say the unlikely story of this unlikely book. We didn't set out to write a book. We we'd written an essay which won a prize, the Tiresias Prize, which is the first um, first time ever given by the International Psychoanalytical Association, and we were really excited about it. It's in 2021, and that prize, one of the one of the uh, uh, rewards of winning the prize, was to have the essay considered for publication in the IJP, the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, the uh, oldest journal in the field, founded by Freud himself, and the essay, we developed the paper into an essay. It went through two rounds of revisions. There were two teams of editors we worked with at IJP, and it had been accepted for publication twice. We got emails confirming it was accepted. We did the further revisions. We spent a year in those revisions, and everything was sailing towards actual publication. We sent in what we thought was the last version, to which we had added some acknowledgments, also a, a one new session, um, section, and then things changed overnight in a way that shocked us. We basically were told that unless we removed certain sections of our acknowledgments and took out altogether the other new section we'd added to the main text, the um, offer of publication was being withdrawn. I'll, I'll let Avi take it up from, from there. Yeah, I mean, we were quite surprised because we were given feedback we were told that we did not have to accept it, even though we actually found the feedback quite interesting and wanted to engage it. And then when we sent in our last revisions together with um, with a footnote, with our acknowledgement, which we actually reproduce in the book um, so that readers can see for themselves what exactly we were being asked to remove. And you know, anybody working in the area of psychoanalysis and queerness will not be surprised to hear that what we were asked to remove were the air, the the sentences that had to do with the, the ways in which psychoanalysis has tortured queer subjects. Uh, it's not the language we use in the footnote, but we make that very clear. And uh, the ways in which psychoanalysis has not sided with thinking towards expansion, but has been siding increasingly so in, in some domains with the backlash that we're seeing against the expansion of queer life uh, in the general in, in, kind of like in, in today's world. And so we were quite shocked to be told, first we were given the option to edit it back to where it was. And when we decided not to take it, it was then that it became clear to us that the publication offer was being withdrawn. Um, things were kind of like really weird. Like there were intimations of a lawsuit um, and uh, we had to decide what we were going to do. So we were not going to allow ourselves to have our words be um, suppressed or for us to use words that we did not think um, captured uh, what is going on in the field. And in that refusal, we were met with a definitive uh, retraction of the publication offer. So then we had to decide what we we're going to do. And um, very much in keeping with the theory in the book, which is that kind of like, um, it is in the aftermath of something that is difficult and traumatic that one is forced to invent and to innovate and to create something out of that trauma. We decided to approach Jonathan House from the translation and um, the Unconscious and Translation Press and uh, asked him if he would be willing to publish uh, what was the Tiresias paper. So basically, um, you know, it's quite striking because the, the, the Committee for Sexual and Gender Diversities of the IPA came together in order to in a way combat institutional transphobia and homophobia. And it is a result of homotransphobia that made their very first awarded paper not be publishable or rather to have its publication commitment retracted. Um, so when we went to Jonathan House, he was not just welcoming, he, um, he was um, 
extremely open and even encouraged us to, to go as far as we wanted. It became clear that we were going to be expanding the paper since we're now talking about a book. Um, he encouraged us to go wherever we needed to go to, to say the things that we needed to say and make the theory that we think is needed to work differently with queer and trans subjects that we don't have and which many of us have felt the limits of what we're working with. So that's, that's how this book came about. And I should yeah, also add that one of the things that was so wonderful about um, Jonathan was that he also said he was excited for us to develop ideas that he might even disagree with. It, it delighted him to imagine that there was the freedom that he could give us the freedom to, to write what we thought and to dare things, right, without having to sort of, you know, sort of limb to some sort of established consensus, because this is not, in fact, we're trying to break away from consensus thinking in many respects. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, yeah, God forbid we talk to anyone or publish anything that we might disagree with. <laughs> exactly. It's like amazing where things have gotten. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And you ended up including um, the kind of presentation about the award itself in the book as well, so that that person also had a chance to like have their voice represented in the book. Yes. Marco Posadas, who was the inaugural chair of the Sexual and Gender Diversity Studies Committee of IPA had written a short essay introducing the history of the Teresita Prize, which was meant less to be an introduction to our essay per se than to say something about the institutional context for the prize. And he'd written that in the expectation that our award-winning essay and revision of it was to be published in IJP. And when that didn't happen, when the offer was made contingent on our basically paring back our, our argument, um, we also, we felt it important if we were going elsewhere, we wanted for Marco's words also to have a space for our public appearance because of basically of the way he put his queer shoulder to the wheel to make things spin differently in psychoanalysis. So this is, we were also really delighted that with uh, the unconscious in translation that um, the press and Jonathan were open to this more, let's say heterodox format, because in addition to this short essay by Marco Posadas, we also reprint a very famous um, essay by Jean Laplanche um, um, that was initially printed in English and Freud in the Sexual, but we now were able to reprint um, an English trans, you know, another English uh, um, appearance of that gender sex in the Sexual. So for those who are new to La Planche, who we draw on very extensively in this, in this book, they also can read this chapter for themselves, right? They'll, they'll have that resource within our volume too. So that was, you know, it's, it's a, a surprising format, I think, this, this book we have an introduction, a chap and two chapters by um, me and Avi, a, a short epilogue by me and Avi, and then the short piece by Marco and this famous chapter by Jean Lafonche. And it's also interesting because the piece that Marco Posadas wrote uh, to introduce the award, you know, without this book, all of that effort would have disappeared, which is another way of saying that here it is, kind of like here is psychoanalysis trying to combat something about its kind of like conservatism and prejudice by putting together this committee and then makes it impossible to have the first awarded paper and the historical context in which that arose, the possibility for the committee and the paper itself arose, kind of like basically be kind of like a risk being lost. And part of what we wanted was to give a home to that history as well, because that history is part of psychoanalytic history, especially yes. the history of queer psychoanalysis. And we, we, we felt it was incredibly important for that to be recognized and recorded. And of course, Marco has been kind of like throughout this extremely supportive um, and has lent his queer shoulder, as Anne said, uh, but also his, his knowledge of institutions to help us figure out how to make this happen. Um. Yeah, I know. In the Jonathan's Press, The Unconscious in Translation, I mean, I love it. I think I have every book that he's put out, except for recently, yeah. there's this Sabina Spielrein I need to get. <laughs> but like, yeah, I've been buying these books. And, and discovering this Laplanche piece, um, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago or something, and between reading that and Tim Dean, I mean, I feel like so much of my thinking was affected by those works. 
And I don't understand how people cannot understand that like people's sexuality, gender, identity, everything is formed. Um, you know, you, you can't say that this kind of person was formed in this way and this kind of person is formed in this way. You can't make these kinds of distinctions of why this happens to a different person. Everybody has kind of developed the way they've de de developed because that's the way they've developed and the story. And that is like more correct than any other way. And I just, I just get so depressed with what the field is doing right now. Until I read your books, <laughs> well, I was gonna say what what the field is doing is itself, I suppose, um, reflective of what's happening in the wider culture, right? The wider cultures in which psychoanalysis is, is operating. So, if psychoanalysis is getting hung up, tripped up on the questions to do with queerness and now especially transness, it is basically, you know, welcome to the wider world where you know there we have violent legislation that's you know basically trying to eradicate trans existence in this country and, and other countries are also having sort of paroxysms of sort of you know sort of panics over over transness and psychoanalysis isn't apart from those cultures in which it exists and unfortunately we have numerous psychoanalysts very lending their respectable names and their respectable credentials to anti-trans legislation we have psychoanalysts participating in attempts to block access to gender affirmative care not just in this country but in Britain, in Australia, and so and in other countries too. But you know, this is psychoanalysis is of the world, and it's doing stuff in the world. And you know, our book is also attempting to offer its own intervention into these conversations within psychoanalysis, and maybe you know, also can 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 offer another set of languages for conversations outside psychoanalysis too. At least that's one of our hopes. Yeah, maybe you could talk. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how you present, how analysis, you know, have the right to kind of narrate their own story, and we need to provide the space for that. Mm. I mean, most definitely, there's a couple of different arguments that we're making in the book that, um, that we have, in fact, had to come up with because they do not exist in our current conversations. And we felt like we had to come up with it because with them because time and again in our clinical work, we had found ourselves coming up against the limits of what our current psychoanalytic discourse around transness and queer life has permitted us or given us the tools with which to work. So eventually we would need, as I think is often the case, to manufacture the kind of thinking that we that is required to be able to proceed with clinical work along more expansive lines. And here's, I wanna be very concrete about what we're doing in this book, which we feel is very new, which is that we are pushing back against two major tides in psychoanalysis, which have parallels in wider culture at this particular moment. The one is the idea that there's something inherently pathological about queer and trans life, um, because it is caused say by trauma or it is caused as it is a result of some um, like defensive process that if addressed properly, somebody can return to their true gender, which is assumed to always be cis and binary. So that kind of thinking starts from the presumption that there's only one healthy position vis-a-vis -vis gender um, and oftentimes sexuality as well, which is um, heterosexual and kind of like one's experience of one gender should be what is assigned at birth, unless something warps it and something kind of like throws it off um, thro throws it off kind of like the the orbit around the body and kind of like chromosomes and so on and so forth in that case you identify what has thrown it off correct it and that should return you to um, cisgender um, and normative gender the other so this is the conservative side of psychoanalysis right there's another side which understands itself for reasons that I think are very easy to see as progressive. And that side understands any kind of non-normativity, be it gendered or sexual, as being just another, just another way of being in the world. Just like you have cis people, you have trans people, just like you have um, heterosexual people, you have gay people. And there's there's it's a there's nothing to see here kind of argument, right? Mm -hmm. That argument takes the position, nobody says it like this in psychoanalysis because it would sound overly simplistic, but it's a version of born this way. It's like the Lady Gaga version of psychoanalysis, kind of like, you're just, you are what you are, like just, there's nothing to see here, just keep it moving, right? 
and this this way of thinking understands itself as progressive we can easily see why because it pushes back against the notion that there's something intrinsically pathological with being uh, cis or uh, for being trans or queer and we have tried to refuse what we have come to feel is a blackmail which is that the only way to push back against transphobic and homophobic psychoanalysis is to say things that actually make zero sense both psychoanalytically and psychically which is that we just come as we are and we just have to discover who we are and accept our identities and kind of like peel back all the layers of kind of like how one protects oneself from the world so that the world does not judge them and you know if you peel all of this back you find deep inside kind of like who you truly are and that needs to be affirmed and you know this idea that we are born this way be it be it in one gender or in one sexuality and all that's needed is affirmation has has stalled us clinically in a variety of different ways um the other thing i would add here is that to to say of queer and trans people that we're born this way and um, it's again it's meant to protect us from attempts to convert us right the conversion therapy whether back to heterosexuality or back to cisness but it actually ends up denying to queer and trans people the kinds of vicissitudes of gender and sexuality that heterosexual and cis people are offered all the time by psychoanalysis. One of the most striking things for us as we're working on this project is we initially thought, well, you know, wait a minute, psychoanalysis demands of queer people, and especially now of trans people, that they give an account of themselves, that they explain where they came from, like where they and where their gender or sexuality went off course, but they don't do that. Psycho we psychoanalysts don't do any kinds of, you know, sort of track the, you know, what's, what's gone awry with heterosexuality and cisgender. Then we're like, actually, no. Psychoanalysis is replete with stories of in profound case studies, important theoretical um, contributions, which are examining the vicissitudes of normative gender. I mean, this is from the beginning of psychoanalysis, whether it's Freud's case study of little Hans or Joan Riviere's famous piece, Womanliness as a Masquerade, the vicissitudes of so-called normative gender the ways in which it causes suffering, it goes off course, the attempt to sort of map its development and changes. This is just part of the, the basic like warp and woof of how psychoanalysis has operated. Why should we not then offer that same dignity of complexity to queer and trans people, right? In fact, who should also get deserve the chance to talk about the miseries of our gender, of our sexuality, its vicissitudes, without there then being the urge to correct and fix. And, and when we're talking about having the space to talk about our complexities and our vicissitudes, we're not just talking about whether patients are allowed to do so in the consulting room, because I think that any analyst would say, I'm not stopping anyone from talking about the complexity of their gender. We're talking about what it means to have theories that have the elasticity to think about gender as having both its pleasures and its failures and that that should also extend to trans people and to non-binary people. So the, the surprising argument that we're making in trying to push back against both of these discourses is that nobody's born in a gender that then just has to be accepted or discovered. The gender is something we all acquire in a variety, like through many complex psychic processes. And here's where Jean Laplanche's theory of gender comes in that we can say a little bit more about. And that this acquisition uh, of one's gender identity happens at the kind of like it happens as, as a process of trying to, in the process of trying to deal with a variety of different traumata, some of them being ontological, like, you know, uh, Laplanche's notion of the enigmatic uh, trauma, the trauma of implantation, um, and some of them not. And to actually begin to push back is what we've wanted to do, to push back against the story that if trauma has any share in how somebody became queer or how somebody became trans or non-binary, then that delegitimizes and um, discredits their gender. We want theories that tell us, and we're trying to build theories and we're hoping others will follow our example of working to produce theories and ways of thinking that don't imagine that trauma is something that, that warps us, but trauma is actually part of how the energies of traumatic experience 
are part of how we become who we are. So we use this somewhat unexpected uh, phrase in the book about thinking about trauma, not as a disruption, but also as a resource. And it can be both. Um, and it is in the aftermath of such trauma that that um, the human being self theorizes, um, or to use another term of Laplanche's that I really love, self mythologizes, because all genders are mythologies. They're mythologies with very real consequences, which is not to say that they're false or that they are untrue. It's to say that they are historically contingent and they have to do with that they're mobile. Uh, they, they, there's nothing authentic or real or true about one's gender. And therefore there's nothing to confirm or disconfirm about one's gender. It just exists um, on the basis of like how it is experienced at any one given moment in time. And, you know, I think it's also important to underscore that we say this, that this is the case of all gender, right? Even as we might be focusing predominantly on queer genders, transgender, you know, non-binary gender in this book, this is the case for so-called normative genders too. You know, all genders in acquisition, trauma may have a share in the development of any gender. So this is not we're making not making transness out to be some sort of special case, even if because of cultural norms, trans people, gender queer people are asked to give an account of ourselves in the way that someone who's normatively gendered generally is not. Absolutely, yeah, I would say trauma <laughs> probably has to do with pretty much everyone's. <laughs> I would say, but, um, and the problem with the born this way argument too, is like, it reminds me of like in the eighties where like, oh, but people are born gay. Like as if, oh, but they can't help it. So you can't like discriminate against people because they can't help it. Like it's some sort of affliction, you know, I just can't take it. And as if one wouldn't wish to be gay. I'm thinking yeah, about, you never um, wish that in your wildest dreams, but right. you know, they just can't help it. <laughs> can't change can't help it can't oh, be well. fun right. <laughs> can't love it's it just, <laughs> such a denial of queer joy and trans joy i'm thinking about the beautiful book by jane ward called the tragedy of heterosexuality which is refusing the notion that homosexuality or lesbianism is a tragedy saying actually no the joy of lesbianism in the case of ward's book might be an offering to heterosexual people like learn from our joy Absolutely. And also the fact that people can develop and evolve over their lifetime. You know, you might you might be in different relationships with all sorts of different people and you might identify differently throughout your life. And, you know, you can be completely fluid in that way. Actually, this is one. Think, um, go ahead, out of you. Okay. Uh, th this is one of the things that we have really, this is one of the interventions that our book makes. Um, if the experience of being trans or being non-binary is not about some core aspect of the self and neither is being cis or, or normatively gendered, um, then what we're doing really in some ways going after the concept of core gender identity, which has been the concept that was given to us by Robert Stoller in working with mostly uh, feminine boys, um, children assigned male at birth, um, who um, he was trying to figure out what, what is going on with their gender. And he came up with this concept of core gender identity, which in a way has kind of like haunted us still and still plays a very important role in thinking about gender in contemporary psychoanalysis, especially the more progressive strands in um, contemporary psychoanalysis. But here's the problem. If, if you are say, for example, trans, because your core gender identity is female, as opposed to you having been um, quote unquote, mistakenly assigned male at birth, then that means that there are or should be protocols by which we can measure that gender identity, determine what it is. And therefore, if we find that you are, to use an old term from Harry Benjamin, and I'll put this in quotes, a true transsexual, then you are deserving of resources. And that's the progressive narrative, by the way. You're deserving of resources, transition healthcare, you're deserving of certain kinds of rights. Um, but what this means is that if your gender shifts later in life and you come to identify as non-binary, or if you come to detransition, then that means that the original assessment of your having been truly trans was wrong. And this, this idea is kind of like sends us into kind of like really a vortex 
of trying to track and assess who's really trans and who's not and who should get a letter and who shouldn't like which is in a way the way in which psychoanalysis gets recruited into normative world building by arguing that kind of like now it is our jobs to assess what somebody's true gender is like i don't know how anybody does that like i don't know how people who think it can be done are doing that except by using very very normative criteria um yeah, I really appreciate also that means... you brought that in, that, that the psychoanalysts are like affecting things out in the world, like legislation and stuff. I hadn't even thought of that before. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, and it's very strange. I mean, we're often put in the position of having, a, you know, we need to write a letter for a patient um, because this is the way insurance works. So if someone is, is, is lucky enough to have insurance that will cover whether it's access to hormones or, or surgeries, they need, will need a, le a letter from, you know, their mental health provider. Um, and so we are, we're in this really strange business with insurance companies having to come up with a narrative that the insurance company will recognize. This may or may not be a narrative accurate to the person we're working with, but, you know, why is it that we are, you know, basically, you know, the judges in this case? It, partly this is to do with the way insurance works, healthcare access is provided. But, you know, our own wish would be that, in fact, that we don't have to be in the business of providing letters, that this shouldn't be up to some medical gatekeepers. This is, in some sense, we're wishing for the demedicalization of transness. Yeah, how about the patients are adults and they can make their own decisions? <laughs> exactly. And that doesn't mean that we are advocating for people saying, you know what, we don't want to be in this business of writing letters, therefore we're not going to write letters. That is absolutely not what we're saying. We're saying that, in fact, we have been brought into this story by, um, by insurance agencies, by the state, and if we were to refuse to write letters, given how things are at the moment, what we would effectively be doing would be condemning people to having a lot of difficulty transitioning or not being able to transition. So this is not about, this is about de, um, kind of like stripping the fantasy from psychoanalysis that we work only in a dyad, that there is not a larger world in which we are embedded and that our decisions in the consulting room have political implications outside, whether we want to or not, however much you may want to imagine a dyad that is sequestered from the rest of the world, that is not true. And you know, you were saying earlier, you were saying earlier, Vanessa, something about kind of like how psychoanalysts affect legislation. And that is very important to know. So this idea that psychoanalysis is apolitical or that it is political to take a stance that supports the flourishing of queer and trans life, where it is, where is it is um, apolitical or objective to not take that stance is a huge problem in our field. We can even go back to you know, our experience with IJP. We were told that we had to edit our acknowledgments because they were too political, which is already extraordinary. I, I, I edited the books. I, and have edited a book series since 1998. I have never edited someone's acknowledgments. It's a very strange thing to do. But the accusation that what we were saying, which was about the affirmation of queer and trans patients and queer and trans analysts was too political is, is extraordinary. Like who gets called political and who gets granted the imprimatur of being you know, the neutral expert? Absolutely. And psychoanalysis, because of these things, I mean, has lost so many great people, like great clinicians and people that could have been in Alisans and done really great work. But, you know, people don't like this. <laughs> They've run the other way, understandably. And, and we don't blame anybody who has run the other way. Uh, and we don't blame anybody who is critical, acutely critical uh, of psychoanalysis. In fact, towards the end of our book, we have a whole section dedicated to um, kind of like fleshing out why we think people have been put off by psychoanalysis and what psychoanalysis needs to do, including an address to the IJP itself, asking the IJP to do better and asking psychoanalysts to be bolder in our theorizing because to stay simpler, kind of like, for example, with a notion that, you know, there's trans people and cis people and non-binary people and just leave it alone, that actually does not serve our patients. And for many, many years, we have been in conversations with colleagues who are either themselves queer or um, gender kind of like diverse or trans um, and have had conversations about clinical moments or situations, um, some of them out, some of them not out, um, 
that kind of like run aground with the particular um, uh, frameworks that we have been trained to work in um, and have found many moments in clinical exchanges with patients where patients come up against the possibility that something about their life may have had something to do with their gender. And because the prevalent notion is that that we're just born into our genders, the idea, the even, even the intimation that some of our history may have something to do with how one became trans or became non-binary or became um, queer, fills patients with such panic and shame and anxiety that that then has to mean that their gender is not true, that it's not worthwhile, that it is not deserving of dignity, of respect, that it becomes very hard to do work in those domains for patients who need it. Not all patients need it. Um, but with those patients, it becomes very hard because patients themselves get scared. Uh, and we've heard from colleagues who have just started reading our book, hearing kind of like we, we got an, an email, a very moving email from somebody who was telling us that their supervisor was really holding them back from these explorations with a patient that the patient wanted and needed to have. Um, but they were feeling like it would be transphobic to go in that direction. We, so we've also experienced the relief, like the, a, a patient's relief at, at there being space for us to talk about, you know, sort of the possibility that there are things that happen to them in their life, which may have contributed to their queerness or the transness and that we were unafraid of that, which made it possible for them to become curious about the development of their gender in a way that wouldn't have been so, I think, with another model of working, if the framework were about core gender identity, for example. So, I, I, so I'm just going to say, I do also want to say that you know this is also about broader political conversations, but it's certainly so in the consulting room as well. That we we are not legislating how anyone should tell the story of their identity, right? We're not saying that okay, since since born that way is a fiction, how dare you? You can never use that language. It is in a world that actually wants there to be as few trans and queer people as possible. Any way that someone gives an account of themselves as queer or trans or non-binary is to be treasured and valued and given the dignity of, of respect, right? So we're not legislating how anyone tells the story of, of, of their identity. But it's certainly the case that for many queer and trans and non-binary people would not say of themselves that, they, that, that their identity feels to them innate. So we have to grant those stories the dignity of respect too. So we're trying to make more space for, for those complexities, including the fact that one story about themselves could change over their own lifetime. Not just the difference between what one trans person says and another, but that one person's own story of themselves could change over the course of their lifetime. So, Absolutely, that's really important. Yeah. And to be clear, like there's nothing wrong with being queer or trans or non-binary. There's no wrong way to be queer or trans and non-binary, and there's no wrong way to become queer or trans or non-binary. Absolutely. Should we talk to about the Laplanche a little for people that don't know? I I'm love doing happy dances right now inside. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to tell you too, because I've been making music lately with this guy, Pete Murphy in the UK. And when I make them, I always just like read my own cut up poems. And my cut up poems are often taken from my psychoanalytic writing and other writing. So I get like pieces of Laplanche or Lacan and Freud in there. And then I was listening to, I, I listened to all our albums like on repeat on shuffle while I like make art. And then this one song came on that like really quotes a lot of Laplanche from from a book that I did. And uh, I was like, I have to send this to Avi. And then I didn't know it was in your book when I sent it to you. And then I got the book and I was like, oh, this is exactly what I sent her. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. I'll put that song at the end of the episode. Oh, that's, that's very cool. <laughs> I that song. And I love like the quotes that you had selected precisely because, you know, there's so much thinking about gender right now that is completely desexualized and has completely lost the tether between um, kind of like the gender that one identifies as and the libidinal forces that are kind of like woven into gender, uh, creating like this false, um, kind of like this false distinction between identity and infantile sexuality, which we talk about a lot in the book, but maybe maybe we can say a little bit about that now in terms of 
kind of like what our stance is on how what we mean by gender being acquired. Um, and do you want to jump in here? Well, I think one of the first things to say is to really stress this, to speak of gender as an acquisition is not to be speaking about a volitional act, right? This is not some neoliberal drop down menu of genders, right? You wake up each, one, each day and decide what gender shall I be today, right? We're, we are psychoanalysts, we're all, but we're also psychoanalysts who think with the social. So we're actually thinking about both unconscious forces, but how the unconscious is itself in some sense swirled in relation to, or itself it, with Laplanche emerges out of, of kind of contact from the outside coming in. And that outside coming in is, is you know, it's, it involves the, the sexual unconscious of the adult, but it also involves a kind of the, the social field um, from within which the human has to make sense of that sort of that, that, that swirling that comes into the subject or the subject to be, I should say. Avi, I'm going to leave it to you to translate my slightly enigmatic, I don't mean that in a Laplacian sense, but my, my own swirl of words. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we, we start with Laplanche's notion that in the encounter between the infant and the adult, the infant is bombarded with messages that are not just, don't just have conscious and um, conscious meanings and also meanings that are kind of like uh, hidden from the child and unknown to the child and unknown to the parent, but are also parasitized by sets of communications that are not just undeciphered, but undecipherable by the parent. And that is what Laplanche calls um, kind of like enig the enigmatic message. And in response to a message that is enigmatic and which is um, kind of like addressed, the child experiences as being addressed to her, the child has to generate a response to that. And some of that generating of a response means taking some of that enigmatic communication and treating, as Laplanche says, treating that message, treating it to create something, uh, to create, to generate a fantasy, to generate what will eventually be, be coded as memory. And it is that treatment of the enigma, which he called translation, which is like, which eventually will create the ego. And also the sense of our gender identity, like the identity that you feel you have, which is not, again, you see like it's not ontological, but it is a response to the trauma of implantation, a response to the trauma of having been exposed to enigma. And Laplanche has this very interesting, I think one of his most radical ideas is that, is, is what he has to say about how we translate enigma, which is that he, he, he posits that the way that we translate is by drawing on the mythosymbolic world of myths and symbols um, and, using them to kind of like create something that then comes to feel like one's own, even though the materials from which it was scavenged did not start with you. It always starts from the other. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, he would say, he has said that like the binary code of gender, male and female become kind of like becomes a set of codes from which the child can then translate her own gender experience. Um, so you come up with this kind of like wildly improvisational theory of gender that has to do with it is part the other's intrusion, the other sexual unconscious, it is part the materials that exist in culture as mediated by the parent, and it is part this queer, strange kind of agency, a queer kind of agency through which one translates, which has to do not with as Anne was saying, like the neoliberal, volitional, willful decision-making of, I want to be this or that, but something that kind of like emerges from a perch that the ego does not command. Um, and, and also something important to sort of add here, um, and this we may, uh, I'll, I'll, may even hear some social theory of a certain kind lurking in the background. Um, we know that Laplanche was actually trained by Louis Althusser, the Marxist thinker, for example, with his famous theory of interpolation, the idea of social identification. Laplanche talks about the ways in which we're bombarded with messages. And one of the messages we're bombarded with by the social and specifically by the little social that is the family and the extended world outside the family is we're bombarded with messages about gender. We are identified by 
the parents or by others in our small social world, right? So our gender comes to us from outside as well. Um, again, it's before we can identify with any gender, we're identified as having a gender by some others. And this is really crucial because it means that in, for a gendered position to become our own, the identification by has to be transformed into an identification with that feels ideally will have the feeling of becoming one's own. Right. Such, that we, such that we can fully forget, we never knew, this is the unconscious after all, but we never knew that it started with an identification by someone else. That's just who we are. Mm -hmm. But it's like we, we make a mistake if we move too quickly to the language of identification with, it starts outside us, identification by. And the identification of by itself is drawing on that social field that the family, the parents are, are, are living in too. No one gets to be outside. Now I'll think with my, my French boyfriend, Foucault, no one's outside this field of discourse. It's what you can do within it. So true. I love it. I love this book and I love your work and it's so important. We have about 10 minutes left. Is there anything that you wanted to be sure that we touched upon that we didn't get to yet? I mean, maybe we can talk a little bit about cisness and the critique we have of the category of cisness um, because we are not just... Um, in suggesting that all gender involves is an acquisition, including cisgender, what we're also fleshing out are the ways in which cisgender is, is not natural either, that it is put in place. Um, and this is an argument that certainly has been made in, um, in relational psychoanalysis, has been put in place through all kinds of disciplining and violations um, to stay within the Kind of like to stay within the contours of masculinity or femininity requires certain kinds of psychic amputations. And many analysts have written about that, like thinking of Diana Lease, who talked about masculinities, and certainly Muriel Dimon and Virginia Goldner. Mm -hmm. What we're wanting to also add to that is kind of like the way in which that uh, kind of like the, the system of binary gender, to the extent that it is also kind of like a colonial, uh, a result of colonial. Um, reach and um, imposition, um, gender always has, it, it is always already a racialized formation. Um, so we are wanting also to kind of like make room for thinking about the interimplication between gender and race in ways that will be hard to go into great detail now, but which we take up in the book. Um, and um, we have been very taken by Kaji Amin's really brilliant argument um, in in an, in an article um, he has called, We're All Non-Binary, um, where he makes um, kind of like the argument that the ways in which people seem to be embracing the identity of non-binariness right now is also, also about the pushing up against the norms of binary gender, people who are not actually engaging in any kind of hormonal or surgical or even kind of like by means of adornment or dress um, presentations that would challenge how you understand binary gender, but that the identification of non-binary becomes a way of, um, of protesting uh, the, the fantasy, the fiction, that there is a way to stay within your, your category, to stay in your gender lane, so to speak. Um, one of the, this is, it's a wonderful piece by Kat Jamin um, that, that just came out, I think last year, um, but one of the things that he also wants to say is this, this particular use of non-binary to describe, in some sense, to show the, the limits of binary gender so that people, again, who present in ways that might be read as binary, yet identify as non-binary. Um, one of the things that, you know, Amin also wants to sort of point to, though, is the kind of, almost the, a certain kind of uh, the neoliberal autonomy of that, that there is a sense of which subjects get to make this proclamation of themselves and demand from others that recognition. And so that there's, I think he's, I think he also has some cons concerns, really wants to flag that this demand for recognition on your own terms and, and, um, and in ways that would not be socially legible, on the one hand, we might say, we might want to, you know, cheerlead and say, yay, he's actually saying, look, but let's, what are the, what does that reinforce? I mean, what kind of subjectivity is that? It's a very individualist subjectivity that um, a kind of liberal autonomy, um, recognition must be granted, 
I, I don't I, I don't know because I feel like the piece of Kaji's essay that's so important is is actually also pointing to, you know, this this fantasy the the fantasy that some liberal subjects of the West have that they can just say, say their identity and others will recognize it and if they don't you're being grievously injured. Mm -hmm. I mean that's that's the thing that is so complex about gender and which we are yet to have a deep conversation about, which is mm -hmm. this tension between on the one hand we want people who are working very hard to have to craft their gender and need the oxygen of recognition for their gender. We want them to have that. We don't want that denied. But there are other ways in which kind of like we also want to will ourselves over others. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, Anne, you have something that you say that's very interesting about your pronouns, which I think would work very well here. So I, I think what you're referring to, Aki, is, um, you know, when I'm asked what my gender pronouns are, like what my preferred gender pronouns are. And the thing I want to say in answer to that is always Bartleby, as in I prefer not. Um, and then, and I mean that seriously, also with, you know, with a wink, but, you know, I will then next say, actually, I'll use any pronoun. And the reason I'll use any pronoun is that I've been called many different names, many different gender names, many different pronouns. And the calling of those names, which started when I was very little, and I would have you know, be waiting to use a restroom and someone would tell me, little boy, you're in the wrong line. From a very early age, my gender was being thrown into doubt by others. And that has an effect. And, you know, speaking of the ways of gender as acquisition and coming in from the outside, all these years is being called all sorts of different names has, has indeed shaped. This has indeed shaped how I understand my gender. It's also why I'm a gender theorist, right? It turned me into a gender theorist. But um, I think that, you know, I use any pronoun because Every pronoun has used me, so why should why shouldn't I get to use it back? Right, but this is not about me as some autonomous subject in the world willing myself. It's me responding to how I've been called by others. But how I've been called by others is not totalizing. Right, I get to do something with it. I mean, this is agency starts with what we didn't get to choose. Right, and so the agency is in some sense the reflexive action and response to a set of constraints that were not ours to sort of define in advance. Now, of course, it's important to underscore that it is here Anne who is saying, I get to do this. This is not about somebody else saying, well, but if people have called you this and they've seen this in you or that in you, why don't I as your analyst or I as your doctor or I as a legislator get to define that for you? And that that is the strange agency that we're trying to work with in this book. Like on the one hand, not, like the neoliberal agency that proceeds from the center itself, not from the self, but of the I have, my friend Genesis would put she with a slash in between. So it would be uh, she and he and like everything in between, anything in the space. I love that. Terrific. Yes, yeah, so our vocabulary can't really keep up with the wild profusion of genders that actually exist in the world here. I'm thinking with, with Gail Rubin, but you know, our, we're, we're always playing catch up to what already is. In, in Greek, um, in Greek, which is the language that I grew up speaking, uh, the non, the kind of like we don't use they, we use it. Um, and kind of like it's a, it's a third, um, it's, it's not a plural, it's a singular, which has kind of like a more ob object thingified quality which kind of like presents a different kind of challenge than, than they. Uh, so kind of like these, these inventions, whether it is they, whether it is the Greek it, whether it is your friends S slash H E, these are all inventions, right? There's nothing true about them. It's, it's ways that people are innovate to try to catch up to something that will always be elusive, but, but the effort nevertheless matters. So to step in and say, this is not right, either because of grammar, as has been done with A, or either because I decided that this is not the way to do it, you should do it differently, because this is not your gender, or because this should not be your pronoun, and so on and so forth, is, is, a, is a violence, a very deep violence, not just to gender, but to the very project of autonomy, of you being a person who out of whom things get secreted and then they're yours. And I use the word secreted here to capture how it's both yours, but it's not so, also not of your um, kind of like decision-making. Yeah, it's an autonomy that's not about sovereign will. Mm. 
I mean, it's, re it's, a, it's, a, it's a relational autonomy, right? Sort of, and you used the language earlier of you, but kind of, you know, we, we scavenge from, from, what's, from what already is, right? And novelty also comes out of the, re the reassemblage of things that already exist in the world, right? So this is, so even the autonomy of invention is an autonomy that's a recycling act. Yeah. I mean, you hear some of that when people say, oh, but look at this person, look at this. You usually hear this, especially with trans women, like this trans woman's femininity, you hear this from kind of like a lot of um, TERFs, like this is a very put up femininity. It's exaggerated. It's not a true femininity, right? Um, and kind of like the implication there is that somebody has the knowledge of what true femininity is, the knowledge and the copyright. And anybody who does it differently is kind of like doing it mimetically as opposed to kind of, like, kind of like the discovery that femininity does not belong to one subject or to one class of subjects, but can be done in a variety of different ways. And that takes a certain kind of humility. Yes, mimicry all the way down. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for being here. Thank you, Vanessa, for the invitation. And thank you for thank writing you so this much. book. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone should read this book. I agree with Griff that it should be taught. This is, this book needs to be taught, and your other books um, should be taught as well, Avi, because these are really essential to the field right now, and this is a great intervention that I think the field really needed. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you so much.